Scandinavia is the least church going, the most affluent, the highest educated, and the most satisfied countries in Europe. They, by every measure, are the most content people in the world. All right? So you can say they're all crazy, but they're happy being crazy. <laughs> now, when you go to Scandinavia, you, 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 you notice the main building right in the center of town is not a big church, but it is a city hall. Reminding me, their religion, and they don't go to church, their religion is humanism. They really care about how they organize their society. And you'd have a big building like this, the city hall in Oslo, with a nave so people can gather, with a pulpit, a lectern rather than a pulpit, and with glorious mosaic images on the wall, celebrating not Bible stories, but celebrating heroic individuals who contributed mightily to their society. It's humanism, almost as a religion. It's fascinating. And it's fun to talk to Scandinavia. It's fun to talk to people all over Europe and find out what makes them tick. I've got a lot of sounding boards. Ollie's a friend of mine who's a school teacher in the Swiss Alps, high in a conservative little village where everybody speaks this, has the same last name. It's a very, very remote part of Switzerland. And I get to talk to Ollie and his family. And a little while ago, I asked Ollie, Ollie, how can you Swiss people so docilely pay such high taxes? And without missing a beat, he just said, well, what's it worth to live in a country where there's no hunger, no homelessness, and where everybody, regardless of the wealth of their parents, has access to quality health care and education? It was just a matter of fact. He wasn't any crusader. He's not considered a liberal at all in his village. He's quite crusty and conservative. But that's just the sort of the starting point in an affluent society that wants to have that kind of level of decency. Uh, there's enough money to cut some slack to the people who are not doing well and still have that Darwinian survival of the fittest thing going on that makes us all work really hard. Um, it's fascinating to talk to Europeans and you realize that we Americans are really compassionate, loving people, but one thing we're not great at is dealing with the gap between rich and poor. We, we are awkward with this and I think part of it's because of our Cold War heritage. We just cannot see things in terms of class warfare. It's not allowed. It's just not allowed. And when you go to the rest of the world, you find out there's a huge gap between rich and poor. There's a gap in our country between rich and, our, and poor, and, uh, it's, which is quite astounding. It's a third world style gap in our country, whether we want to admit it or not. And then the gap between the wealthy world and the have-nots is growing pretty dramatically. When you do travel, you've got it reaching into your window. Ever since I've been a kid, I've had poor people reaching in my window. And it's pretty apparent to me, half of humanity is trying to live on $2 a day. It's clear to me because I've been out there. The average lot in life for women on this planet is to spend many hours a day walking for water. They don't get a manicure and a pedicure. They don't get to go to a doctor and complain about selection of doctors. Once, a, once, twice a month, they get a doctor visiting their village and they take it, you know? And uh, it's a difficult world out there. And when you travel and when you think about it, you realize even if you're motivated only by greed, if you know what's good for you, you don't want to be filthy rich in a desperately poor world. It's just not a nice place to raise your kids. You see it when you travel. You see it in Central America. In Central America, any middle class neighborhood has to pool its money to hire an armed guard to stand on the corner and keep the angry poor kids away so your kids can get outside. It's coming our way. It's coming our way in a hurry. I was just driving from, I think it was Dallas, out to Plano in Texas past 10 miles of fortified front yards. Literally chicken wire retrofitted over the front yards so those kids could get outside and get some fresh air and not be endangered by all the poor kids. You know, that's just a reality. And it, we don't have to have that. You know, Europe doesn't have that because they tax people a little bit. I mean, it's just a price you pay for that kind of a world from a European point of view. And I just don't like the specter of raising your kids behind designer fortifications, which is the norm in most of the world. And when I've traveled, I've really realized these little girls are just as precious as my little girl. It's such a beautiful thing to realize. It's not painful, it's a celebration. This world is filled with joy. It's filled with potential. It's filled with deserving children. We're so quick to say, what about the children, you know? Well, what about the children? My girl's got $5,000 for straight teeth and money left over for whitener. And I noticed every kid in her class has the wherewithal to scrape together 5,000 bucks for straight teeth and money left over for whitener. And that's right. I work hard. We have a winning system. My girl gets straight teeth. That's no problem. But that doesn't neglect the fact that for the average little girl on this planet, they just wish they had a mom at home to feed them because she's out walking for water. And for the cost of two sets of braces, you could drill a well in that little town and the mom could stay home and love their kids. 
That's not a guilt trip, that's, a, that's an opportunity, if you ask me. And if you're really interested in national security, I would challenge you to think about soft power as well as hard power. Because for 10,000 bucks, you could drill a well in a town, all the moms could stay home. And instead of walking across the county every morning, they could walk across the street. And then when they pumped that water and drinking water came out of it, they'd think, God bless America. <laughs> that's what they'd think. And that's pretty powerful stuff. Or you could take a uh, hundred of them, villages, and take that money and put one soldier in Afghanistan for one year. A million dollars, you see. It's just a choice we make. Now, of course, the wells are going to do more for our national security and our well-being, and not to mention help a lot of beautiful people, than one soldier in Afghanistan. But it's not going to happen. Because nobody here makes money when you drill a well there for 10,000 bucks. And somebody here makes lots of money when you spend a million dollars to keep a soldier in Afghanistan. I think that's the ugly truth. And that's what we just won't talk about as we deal with our budget crisis. We are confronted with by pretty, some pretty complex and unprecedented challenges in our day and age. We've got the reality of angry Islam. We've got climate change. We've got the gap between rich and poor. And we've got a lot of hope. There's a lot of opportunity. And it's exciting when we think about how we're going to deal with this. When I think about how we're going to deal with it, it's, it's shaped by our worldview. And our worldview is shaped by a whole grab bag of different influences. Everybody here has got a different worldview because we have a different life experience. A big part of my worldview, obviously, is a lot of travel. I've spent a lot of time overseas, and the value of that is nothing new. 1,500 years ago, Mohammed said, don't tell me how educated you are. Tell me how much you've traveled. Thomas Jefferson traveled, and he wrote that travel makes a person wiser if less happy. Mark Twain traveled, and he wrote that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. <laughs> and I've traveled a lot, and I'll tell you, it is such a joy to be able to celebrate rather than fear the diversity on this planet. Let me just finish with a little trip to Turkey here. I was, a, as a tour guide, taking a group to the east of Turkey, and my group was curious about the whirling dervishes, so I wanted to find them a dervish so they could see him whirl. And I found a guy who was a dervish, and I said, can my group watch you pray? And he said, I'm not a photo op. You can watch me pray, but you've got to understand what I'm doing. And I said, that's cool. So, and I'll just paraphrase here to simplify it. But, um, so we gathered with him as the sun was setting, went up onto his rooftop, he was all dressed up like a, a dervish. And he said, I'm a follower of Mevlana. He's sort of the prophet of love in my religion, kind of like St. Francis is in yours. Easy to get your brain around St. Francis, easy to get your brain around Mevlana. Five times a day, I meditate on the teachings of Mevlana. I dress up like my monk's outfit. I plant one foot in my hometown, my family, my community. The other foot goes around acknowledging the beautiful variety on this planet of God's great creation. All the variety. One hand goes up and accepts the love of our maker, our creator, our God. The other hand goes down like the spout of a tea kettle, showering God's love on his creation. The beautiful variety, my home, my family, my community. And five times a day he whirls and he gets himself into a meditative trance. And we were there witnessing that. His head tilted over, his robe billowed out. I looked at him, lost in that thought, being a conduit between God's love and his world. And I looked at the eyes and the faces of my tourists, taking that in. And all of a sudden this guy was no longer so freaky and scary. He's different, sure. But fundamentally, we're all together. <laughs> and to go home with that understanding, and then to implement that in the way we live out our lives here as citizens of this great country, is a beautiful, powerful thing. And that's, to me, the most important souvenir. And when we live that out here as citizens of the planet, as well as thankful Americans, I think that is making travel a political act. And that's something I love to come to Spokane and talk about. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.